Hello, and welcome to this film about errors and uncertainties. It's another of the introductory films at the start of the waste chemistry course, and whereas before we were dealing with chemical formulas, we're now going to start looking at the measurements that we might make in chemistry and um, some of the errors associated with those measurements. Okay, and hopefully by the end of this film, you'll know the difference between a random uncertainty or random error and a systematic error. You'll um, be able to uh, describe the precision and accuracy of measurements um, and know that there's quite a significant difference between those two words when we use them in a scientific context, even though um, in common usage they're used almost interchangeably. And we're going to start looking a little bit about um, what we mean by significant figures, just in case this isn't something that's already clear to you. Okay, we'll start off by looking at what we mean by errors in experiments, and it's important to realize that they're not the same thing as mistakes. So if I don't follow a method carefully, for example, if I'm slow pressing start on my stop clock when I'm trying to record how fast something's going, um, then I'm being careless. I'm, not, I'm, I'm making mistakes in my experiment. I'm not introducing errors. Okay? So there's a difference between mistakes, which we can avoid if we're careful, and errors which we can't avoid, no matter how carefully we do the experiment. Okay? So that's really important, because when it comes to writing up experiments, you don't want to include mistakes when you're analyzing the errors that are present in your experiment. Okay, let's have a look at the two different types of error that we can see in chemistry. There are things called systematic errors. Now, these are errors which always skew our results in a particular direction. Now, if you imagine uh, someone in your house was on a diet and they um, deliberately set the bathroom scales up so that they always read five kilos less than the actual mass of the person, um, then it wouldn't matter who recorded their mass on those scales, they'd always get an underestimate of the value. So in other words, there'd be a systematic error here. right? It would always be underestimating the true mass Okay, every time we made a measurement on these scales. Now, the thing about systematic errors is that they'll always take the results in one direction. So they'll always either underestimate or overestimate compared to what the true value is. Okay, Random errors on the other hand, they can go in either direction. Now, if we look at this piece of equipment here, which pretty soon, hopefully, you'll recognize as a volumetric pipette, this um, volumetric pipette on it says that it dis dispenses 25 milliliters or 25 centimeters cubed. So every time I take a volume of liquid from this pipette, I'm going to be taking 25 centimeters cubed. However, I can't be absolutely certain that I'm going to get exactly 25 centimeters cubed, no matter how careful I am. In fact, the manufacturer has pointed out to me here that every time I make a measurement with this pipette, there's going to be an error or a random uncertainty or a random error in my reading. Okay, And in fact, they've quantified that as being plus or minus 0 0.03 centimeters cubed. So any time I dispense a volume of liquid using this pipette, it's going to be as much as 25.03 uh, centimeters cubed, or as little as 24.97, and it's going to be somewhere in that range, but I don't know where, so I'm uncertain about it. It's random because it could be either bigger or smaller. Okay, if I weigh something out on this balance, which is looks like what well, most people would call this, uh, they look at that and they go, "Oh, that's quite an accurate balance. It reads to four decimal places." Okay, so if I um, weighed something on this balance and I discovered it would uh, weighed 1.0234 grams, okay, there'd be an uncertainty in that because my balance is having to round this last decimal place. Okay, so if it had measured as much as 1.02345 grams or as little as 1.02335 grams, it would display this mass. So in other words, there's a random error in this mass reading, which is half the final decimal place. And when we're using digital um, measuring devices of this sort, then usually we quote the error as being half the final decimal place. OK? So with both these pieces of equipment, I can't be absolutely certain that the value that I'm getting on the screen is correct. There's going to be a random error, which could be up or it could be down. But 
if I'm careful, and if I repeat my experiments enough, then I can take an average. And what that will do is it will ensure that all the slightly high values and all the slightly low values will average out and give me something close to a true value. So it's very important when we do an experiment that we take averages because that will get rid of any random errors. It won't get rid of any systematic errors, okay? Because they'll all either be too high or too low. And averaging them will just give us a number that's too high or too low, okay? Now, let's have a look at the difference between precision and accuracy. Now, people often, as I say, use these words to mean the same thing, but they mean very different things in science. Precision is often referred to, how, uh, is often described as how repeatable our results are. In other words, if I'm throwing, and the analogy that's often given is that if I'm throwing darts at a, a dartboard, if, I, if all my throws are very close together, I'm getting the same measurement each time, and my results are repeatable. In other words, there's not a very big range in my results, okay? Whereas accuracy, accuracy is a measure of how close to a true value I am. So again, with my dartboard analogy, if I was averaging, if my throws were averaging out to be in the center of the board, if I was aiming at the center of the board, that is, then I'd be close to the truth, okay? And I sometimes might be very precise and very accurate, or might be one or the other, or neither. Now, another way of thinking of precision is uh, by thinking about it's, it's, um, it's essentially a measure of the range of possible values that I can get. Okay, So if I measure a mass on this balance, which reads to one decimal place, okay, let's say I measured uh, the mass of something and it was 1.0 grams, okay, um, there would be a range here. It might be as high as 1.05. It might be as low as 0.95. So my range of possible values is plus or minus 0.05. Okay, so just write that out without all the other junk there. So 1.0 grams plus or minus 0.05 grams. Okay, so the range of possible values that I've got every time I record a mass with this balance is 0.05 grams. If I do it on a four decimal place balance and I measure another mass that maybe was 0 0.9000 grams, then the range here is half of that last decimal place, so plus or minus 0 0.405 five grams. Okay, So this balance is more precise because I'm getting a smaller range of possible values. Okay, It might not be more accurate, but to decide which one is more accurate, I have to know what the actual mass of the thing that I was weighing was. So if the thing actually weighed 1.1 grams or 1.10 grams or whatever, then this balance would be more accurate because it would be closer to the true value. This one would be less accurate but still more precise. And if we look at what we mean by precision and accuracy in terms of these graphs, we can see here we've got good accuracy and good precision. So my, I've got a narrow range of possible values that I'm getting, which means I'm very precise. And my average is close to the true value, so I'm very accurate. Here I've got a narrow range of possible values, but I'm a long way from the true value with my average. So although I'm precise, I'm not very accurate. Okay? So that's um, like this balance here. We're saying it wasn't close to the true value, but it was very precise. Okay? Because they're a very narrow range of possible values for my reading. All right? Here we've got someone who's accurate but not very precise. So they're getting a broad range of values for their measurement, like this balance here, but the average of all these readings is close to the true value. Okay, so they're accurate but not very precise. This person here is not very precise and not very accurate either because their average is a long way from the true value and then they're getting a big spread of measured values. And what we'd like every time we do an experiment is good accuracy and good precision, but it's not always possible. And the main thing is not that we achieve this, but that we're good at assessing how accurate and precise we were. And in order to do that, obviously, we need to understand the meaning of the terms. Okay, finally, we'll have a quick look at what we mean by significant figures. Now, this is often uh, explained in terms of zeros, okay, and we can find an explanation uh, to do with zeros in our IB textbook. So I'm, I'm going to avoid that explanation. I'm just going to explain it in a slightly different way in case 
this talk of zeros confuses you slightly. Okay, but we need to be able to do two things really. Later on, we'll see it, how we uh, see how we deal with numbers with different numbers of significant figures. But for now, we're going to look at deciding how many significant figures there are in a number and writing numbers to a certain number of significant figures. Okay. Now, the way I'm going to get, way I'm going to explain this in this particular film is I'm going to get you to write the numbers in standard form. And when we're writing a number in standard form, we have a non-zero digit before a decimal place, and then there might be some numbers after the decimal place and multiply by 10 to some power. Okay? So we're going to do that for every one of these numbers. We're going to start with a non-zero number and then we're going to write down all the other information we've got and multiply by 10 to a certain power. Now hopefully you've done this before in maths, so I'm not going to go through the maths a bit much, but I'd write this number here as 2.5600 because I've got information about this number here, so I'm going to write it all down. And then I'm going to write that times 10 to the 4. Okay? This one here would be 3.4 0, 1 times 10 to the minus 2. This one is the first non zero digit is 1, and I've got no information after that, so the best I can do here is write that 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Here I'd write 1, 0, 1 point, I should say, 1 point zero, zero, 0, times 10 to the 4. Okay, and here I'd write 2.397 times 10 to the minus 4. So in each of these examples, all I'm doing is I'm starting with the first non-zero digit, and then I'm writing all the information that I've got after the decimal point, and I'm multiplying by 10 to a certain power. Now, to decide how many significant figures there are in these numbers, all I have to do is look at my standard, figure, standard form number and see how many numbers there are here before the 10 to the power of. So this one is five significant figures. This one's four significant figures. This one's one significant figure. This one's five significant figures, and this one's four. Okay? So if you do get a little bit confused by talk of leading and trailing and placeholder zeros and all this kind of thing, then maybe trying it out in this way will help you understand it a bit better. Now, to just finish off with, we're going to look at how we'd write these numbers to a certain number of significant figures. Okay? I'm going to try and write them all to three significant figures. What this means is every time I write one of these numbers, I'm only going to have three numbers in my standard form. So this one would be 2.56 times 10 to the 4. This one would be 3.40 because the one would round down. Yeah, so 3.40 times 10 to the minus 2. This one, I've only got one number, so I can't write it to three significant figures without making some numbers up. So I can't actually write this one to three significant figures. This one would be 1.00 times 10 to the Okay, so I'm simply trimming these numbers down to three, to three numbers in my standard form. If I've got less than that, I can't do that. This one here, the 7 would cause the 9 to round up. But if the 9 rounds up, then the 3 becomes a 4. So this one would be 2.40 times 10 to the minus 4. Because I've got to write three numbers here if it's going to be three significant figures. Okay. As I said before, we're going to deal more with what we do with significant figures in the next film. But if you've got any questions about the things that have been covered in this film, please come and ask me as soon as you can, or post a comment on the YouTube so that other people can get the benefit of your questions and indeed of the answers.